Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the gospel. This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855 855- 237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantino. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all holy and good and life-giving spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Well, hello, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to Search the Scriptures Live. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantino. This is episode 214 of Search the Scriptures Live, and today's date is July 17th, 2023. It's our 32nd lesson on Matthew. We just might finish the Sermon on the Mount today. That's the plan. And I just want to remind you that you can find all of the lessons of Search the Scriptures Live and Search the Scriptures, the original pre-recorded version on at orthodoxbiblestudy.info, orthodoxbiblestudy.info. And uh, they're organized all in one page. That makes them much easier to find. Uh, it can be a challenge to find all of the, the lessons you want or the subject that you want. I hate to say it on the AFR site, but it's the truth because you have to start on the AFR site with the most recent and then you go back. That one, uh, that the Orthodox Bible Study dot info has everything arranged uh, according to subjects and then kind of chronologically. And there's still a little bit of work for me to do on that site. But I do think it's easier for you. Sometimes I'm bringing this up because sometimes people ask me, where can I find this and such lesson? And uh, there the lessons have some titles and it's easier for you to find. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about casting pearls before swine because I had an interesting conversation with a former student of mine who's interested in orthodoxy. And he was asking me about a YouTube video that he saw in which an Orthodox priest was invited to have a conversation with a Protestant on YouTube about the issue of salvation. And um, I just wanted to describe, this is secondhand, of course. I don't know who the priest is, and I don't know what the site was. He couldn't really could remember. But I th- do think it's a kind of characteristic of what we see in discussions between Orthodox Christians and Western Christians. And I wanted to talk to you about it because it did remind me of our lesson last week about not casting your pearls before swine. Not because Protestants are swine. Don't take it the wrong way. That's just an expression. It's about giving things or explaining things to people who cannot appreciate them or comprehend them. It's about what the Lord was talking about was discernment in our conversations and what we say about the faith, because people can't always receive what we're trying to say. They don't understand what we're trying to say. And yet sometimes they press us to hand over our pearls. So let me just tell you what happened. So apparently this Protestant host was saying that the fathers say that outside the church, there is no salvation. That's a very famous statement that was made by St. Cyprian outside the church. There is no salvation. So this priest, now most of the times the fathers don't say that directly, but that's, that is true that we speak about salvation being within the church. So this uh, Protestant um, host was saying, well, what does the Orthodox church say about who can be saved? And the priest, the Orthodox priest, answered completely correctly that, 
We know that salvation is available through the church. Outside of the church, we don't know because the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wishes. And uh, that was a perfectly normal uh, Orthodox response. We're not we're not denying what we don't know. We do know about what's in the church. We know that that's the best way for salvation. Outside of the church, God can do what he wishes. We don't know where the Holy Spirit, we can't place limits on the Holy Spirit. So um, the Protestant fellow kept pressing him, but the fathers say this, and you do say that you believe in the fathers and you follow the fathers. Well, how can you say that you follow the fathers when the fathers say this? So um, will I be saved if I'm not Orthodox? You know, what do you say? So he was pushing and pushing because he gave the poor priest only two options. Either you follow the fathers, you say you do. So you're denying the fathers, basically, that you actually believe in what the fathers say, that you're following the fathers, or you're saying that there can be uh, no salvation. In other words, a very literal and very limited and very... Um, extreme and narrow view of salvation, which the priest was saying is actually not true in orthodoxy. So he kept insisting that the priest make a choice between whether he really believes the fathers or, or not, okay? And so finally the priest says, well, okay. So the guy says, well, what do you think? Can I be saved? And then the priest just said, well, your chances are not so good. <laughs> that was what he said, apparently. So because, the, again, the Protestant f fellow insisted that he make a choice and this between two options and this is classic for anybody who's who's had to ha or tried to have a conversation with a protestant or a catholic and we I, I just wanted to bring this up to you to show you that we have to have discernment and recognize that we cannot accurately convey orthodoxy to somebody who has that mentality this is what you believe, and you either have to accept this in the most extreme and rigid and narrow sense that I have uh, presented to you, or that you're, you're saying that you really don't believe that at all. And I'm sure that the Protestant guy felt very smug and satisfied because he got the priest to say something that really the priest was not prepared to say, not because he thinks that there's some alternative to orthodoxy, but because of the manner in which the argument was presented. So I would not have answered that question. I wouldn't have let somebody push me or bully me into answering something in a way that doesn't accurately reflect the Orthodox faith. But the Protestant guy can't see that because it, the, the Western mind is all about creating very rigid um, opposite opinions. It's either faith alone or faith and works. It's either the scripture or alone or scripture or tradition. So they create these opposites and they force you to choose between one of the two. Well, what if the answer is C or none of the above, neither of the above? That's what it is most of the time for the Orthodox. Most of the time we simply don't fit into those Western categories and we should absolutely not allow ourselves to be pigeonholed into them because when we do, it really misrepresents what the Orthodox Church stands for and is all about. So I, I thought this was also a very good opportunity for us to talk about the context of patristic statements, because I do believe it was in the last uh, podcast I talked about the context of, of uh, remembering context. Now, now remember that the fathers of the church, most of the ones, certainly the ones that the Protestant fellow was talking about, what they call fathers are just the earlier fathers. We have fathers from every era, as you know. But when they talk about the fathers, they're thinking about the classic era, the golden age of the fathers, the ones who were in the fourth century, third, second, third, fourth centuries. So for them, uh, remember that the fathers were not talking about Protestants and Catholics. The fathers, when they were talking about salvation within the church, they were fighting against Arians who denied the full divinity of Christ or against pagans who are worshiping idols. Do you see my point? So it's not fair to take the words of the fathers and force them to address a situation which they did not address. They did not talk about the Protestant Reformation. Okay. So some of the fathers responded to certain Catholic errors like, you know, St. Gregory Palamas or St. Fotios. But most of the ones, and certainly the ones that are called fathers by Western Christians, the early ones are not engaged in that kind of, a, they're, they're not imagining that situation where there's a person who sincerely respects and believes and worships Jesus Christ, 
and maybe believes in the Trinity and the incarnation and the resurrection and all the things that are the mark of a Christian. Okay, and we're not talking about Christians who don't believe in the Trinity. Or they're not really Christians. We're talking about people who hold traditional Christian views. I don't know what the fathers would say about that. Okay, now there's something else to consider. The fathers were acting as pastors. The fathers of the church, even today, do not write about speculative theology. They don't write about theoretical concepts. They're preaching to a congregation or writing for a congregation. Now, the congregation might be other monastics. They might be people in the world, certainly for St. John Chrysostom. It's a, it's a city parish in Antioch that he's writing to. So what do you expect them to say? Are they going to be talking about how people can be saved outside the church? That would be stupid, okay? How, how they're going to give a sermon about how people can be saved outside the church. What are they going to be talking about to that congregation? Um, we have to remember that, um, that the, there's a a purpose for this sermon or that writing. And I discussed this with you last week. I want you to always keep this in mind. Who is the audience and what was the purpose of the speaker? Because you always must take that into consideration if you want to properly understand their words and not misuse them. And unfortunately, because now that Protestants have discovered the fathers, they're doing to the fathers what they do to the scriptures. They're lifting statements out of context. And Catholics have been doing that for a long time, too. But that's what the, script, the Protestants do with the scriptures. They take a couple of verses, take them out of context, and they try to use them to prove something um, in a completely isolated and unnatural manner. So you have to be very careful about this. And this is not a war of scriptural quotations, and it's certainly not a war of patristic quotations. Uh, somebody told me once that he complained about the parish priest, and he said that the parish priest sermons were not very deep. They weren't very complicated. They weren't really strict enough or challenging enough. And, and I, I said, who do you think the priest is preaching to? I mean, think about the ordinary congregation. I'm not saying that the priest should give fluff. But the ordinary congregation is a very diverse group of people. Some of them are old and some of them are young. Some of them are highly educated and not at all. Some are very spiritual and others are very worldly. They have different personalities. They have different backgrounds. They're all at different levels. How does the, preach, how does the priest preach to that kind of a group? He's not going to be giving very deep theological statements to a group like that. It won't be of benefit to the congregation. You have to remember that the fathers of the church were interested in providing something useful, something beneficial to the congregation. And when there's an ordinary parish, the priest is going to speak to sort of the mid-level range, what they can uh, absorb, what they can understand, and what they can benefit for. Uh, from he's not able to respond to everybody's needs in one sermon and and the fact the fact is if he tries to preach it in a way that really shows up people have said this by the way this is amazing to me people have said that saint john chrysostom didn't really <laughs> know that much about the scriptures because he's preaching on a very basic level and they say well he's just this moralist, you know, he's just telling the congregation about how they ought to live their lives. Well, Chrysostom was a very sophisticated, very deep exegete of the scriptures, but he's not giving a sermon. Remember, all of these things I'm reading to you are sermons to a congregation. His purpose in ascending the pulpit is not to show off what he knows. We have actually no idea of everything that Chrysostom knows. I have certain suspicions that his knowledge was much, much vaster and deeper, and his sophistication was much, much greater than what we know. But he's not there to show off what he knows. He's not there to discuss speculative theology about who might be saved outside the church. How does that benefit the congregation? It doesn't. And not only that, so we sometimes see, for example, we sometimes see things that appear to be contradictions. Chrysostom, there are places where he says God does not get angry, right? Because he knows theologically that is true. God does not get angry. On the other hand, he'll say to the congregations on some other occasion, you know, let us not anger God by our sins. Well, Father John, the, Chris, the congregation might say, I thought you said God does not get angry. Well, that's an image that the scriptures use. 
Theologically speaking, it is true that God does not go, go from a state of calm to a state of anger. That is an image that's used by the Bible. So we have to understand the purpose in which he's expressing that or the reason why he is expressing this. So when he says God does not get angry, God doesn't have feet with which to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's saying this because he doesn't want them to have a, too much of an anthropomorphic idea about God. Okay, so we have to understand his point. So, you know, this, this poor Protestant host was trying to get the poor Orthodox priest to say something very definitive because that's what they like. They want clear distinctions about who can be saved, who cannot be saved in the Orthodox Church. And then he tries to use the, the father's to make his point, but he was misusing the fathers. Can God save anyone? Absolutely. Is your priest going to give a sermon on how God can save anybody? Of course not. What good would that do? Wouldn't that encourage you to come up with all kinds of excuses for why you don't have to do this or that or the other thing? You know, I've had people ask me, well, why do I have to be baptized? The thief on the cross entered paradise. He wasn't baptized. Is that, can you see, this is the human uh, personality. We have a tendency to want to do the minimum, okay? We want to have all kinds of excuses for why we can't do this, that, or the other thing that we really should do. So the fathers of the church were not engaged with in theoretical discussions about who could be saved. And the reason why this, this, uh, Protestant fellow and certainly Catholics also don't understand that is because they do theologize with speculative theology. They do have conversations. Well, what if, or how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? Okay. They do engage the, in these discussions that are simply about intellectual gymnastics, simply speculations about non-existent situations. Okay. Or about possibilities. The fathers were always very practical. And here's why. Orthodox theology has one purpose, the salvation of the soul. That's the reason why theology exists. Okay. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's not a philosophical pursuit. And for those of you who simply sit and talk about theology simply to show how much you know, you're really not Orthodox. That is not the Orthodox tradition. And the fathers of the church decry that. And they, uh, they talk about how wrong that is. But in the West, theology begins with philosophy. They learn how to argue, how to construct arguments, how to uh, speculate. All right. And so it is correct that in orthodoxy, we do say salvation is within the church, but we also say that whoever is saved is God's business. Okay. That's not for us to examine. And this is the meaning of the parable in the vineyard. Remember that parable? <laughs> this is the parable in which the Lord gives an example of a man, a, the owner of a vineyard, who hires somebody at yeah, some people to work at the you know uh, first hour of the day, and uh, he promises them one denarius, and then he hires more people at the third hour, more people at the sixth hour. Finally, people show up at the eleventh hour, and when the time comes to pay the workers, they all get the same amount. That is an image of the kingdom of heaven, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you're a faithful Orthodox Christian your whole life or whether you are, you know, you come to Christ and faith in Christ at the very last minute, like the thief on the cross, you're getting the same reward. It's eternal life, okay? So, and so when, they, when the workers in the parable complain to the owner of the vineyard, he says, I'm giving you exactly what I promised you. Why are you begrudging the other one? This is a very important thing for us to remember. So we don't judge those on the outside. That's for God to do. So when you're having a discussion with someone who is not an Orthodox Christian, don't allow them to box you in to only two options and force you to make an either or choice. That's typical of Western argumentation. And um, 
and then that's really it it ends up distort distorting orthodoxy they try to force you to make a statement that really does not correctly represent the fathers or orthodoxy and so you have to be very careful when you engage in these kinds of things because the 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 purpose is to make you look foolish okay frankly that's what it is and to make you to discredit you so once you accept those parameters that they have um created you can't possibly prevail in that kind of a discussion because orthodoxy doesn't fit within those parameters. We don't theologize that way. We don't think in that manner. So this is what I'm trying to uh, encourage you to be careful about and instead to try to um, reclaim the ground. And the ground, the common ground is what was the early church like? How did the early church operate? And instead say that you tell them, I can't have this discussion with you because you don't understand how the early church thought. The early church did not think and theologize the way you do. The early church did not use sola scriptura. The early church did not use the fathers as a weapon to try to prove a point. They understood the broad picture. Orthodox theology is very subtle, and it's it's not something that it can be reduced to very simple, simplistic answers. And we're going to see some of that in our discussion today as we round out and finish off this sermon on the Mount. So let's go ahead and talk about that. The, in the very end, we're at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is uh, chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel, verses 13 to 29. And um, we see a sharp contrast here made between two kinds of people in this as he's the, as the Lord is closing up this uh, sermon. And that has to do with those who bear fruit and those who do not, those who do God's will, those who do not. So let us take a look at verse uh, 13, which is about the narrow gate. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow. And the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, how does that compare to what we hear in so much of the Christian world? Just say this prayer, say you believe in Jesus Christ, accept him into your life, say this prayer, and you're saved. You never have to worry about it again. Does that sound like what the Lord is saying here? The gate is to eternal life is narrow and hard and very few people find it. No, it doesn't sound like that at all, but that is what has developed in the Protestant world as an easy answer because it makes people feel good. And they point to a couple of verses in the Bible, which they lift out of context and ignore the rest of the Bible. And it's not simply because of those verses, but because they're responding against the Catholic church. The Catholic Church was talking about how you need works. You have to have merit. You have to kind of, there is a sense of earning salvation. Not exactly, but there is a sense of it that you have to pay for your sins or you can rely on the merits of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints to get you kind of over the finish line. All right. That concept is absent in orthodoxy. So when you're having a conversation with a Protestant, you have to remember that all of their arguments are geared against Catholicism and they're presuming many concepts that we do not have and we would totally reject. We have no concept of merit in the Orthodox Church. We don't believe in purgatory. Therefore, part of the, the reason for purgatory is this Catholic idea that everybody dies with still some taint of sin and before you can go and be with God, you have to be cleansed of your sin in this purgatorial fire. The only people who escape that are the saints, but everybody else has to go through purgatory. We don't have that concept. So we don't believe that you're going to gain something by the life of Mary, the saints, or Jesus, okay? In other words, in the sense of a spiritual credit. We don't believe that at all. In fact, we quite believe the opposite. The only thing that the saints do for us is provide us an example, and we ask them to pray for us. But we don't directly benefit from their good deeds. That's a huge difference. It's a very legalistic idea of salvation that is present in Western Christianity, something that we don't have at all. And yet there is something that the individual person 
must do to be saved. Not because we earn it, not because we're depending upon merit, but because Jesus Christ says it here at the end of Matthew chapter 7 and many other places in the gospel. And St. Paul talks about it often, how we have to change, how we have to be transformed. This is not simply accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then somehow you think that magically you're going to be transformed that your life is going to change. You're going to become a more spiritual person. That doesn't happen. We have to put effort into that. And that's what the Lord is talking about here. Now, St. Gregory Palamas asks the question, why is the gate narrow? And why is it difficult to be saved? And it's a very simple answer. Because God is holy and he's calling us to holiness. So it's not enough to simply say, I believe in Jesus Christ. We can't enter the kingdom of heaven simply because we believe. Well, the devil believes in Jesus Christ too. Okay, he's not going to heaven. So why is it not enough simply to have faith? Because for us, and this is another huge difference between us and Western Christians, salvation for us is eternal life in union with God. Now, Catholics will say they believe that too, but it's not the same, okay? And it's too complicated for me to get into that subject now. But eternal life in union with God is only possible if we are holy because God is holy. Now, that's the reason why Catholics say you have to go through purgatory to burn off all of your excess sin so that you have this union with God. Um, we don't believe that because for us, salvation is a process, an ongoing process that actually continues after our death, we continue to grow in grace and holiness, but we have to put ourselves on that path in this life, okay? So salvation is a matter of acquiring holiness, the, the grace of the Holy Spirit, so that we can have union with God in the next life. That's why it's difficult. It is not something that is easy. Now let's see what St. Basil says about the narrow gate in one of his sermons, and this is the sermon on a homily on detachment from worldly things. Oh, I think this is really great. We are not willing even to give careful consideration to what sort of loads will make our journey light, those which can improve us when we have gathered them and make our life hereafter exceedingly joyful since they become the personal possession of those who have them, nor do we consider what sort of loads are heavy and cumbersome and drag us to the ground, those which by nature are utterly unsuitable for human beings, not even allowing the ones who have them to enter through the narrow gate. So what he's trying to say is that when we form attachments, to worldly things, to the things of this life, to material possessions. They make us too wide, too heavy to enter through the narrow gate. That's what he's saying. So by nature, we cannot possess them. Why not? Because they're not human. When we die, we don't take our clothes with us, our cars with us, our money with us. We can't take anything worldly, any material possessions with us. The only thing we can take is what is according to our nature. And what is that? Virtue, virtue is part of our nature because we're made in the image and likeness of God. So as St. Basil continues, he says this, on the contrary, those things which we should have gathered here on this earth, we ignore, but those which we should disdain here, we gather. And those which can be united with us truly become an adornment natural to soul and body alike these to these we are not attentive at all but those which will never belong to us but only mark us with shame these we attempt to gather laboring without purpose and toiling in great toils like a self-deceived man who wants to draw water in a leaky jar so we spend our lives trying to accumulate possessions and nice house and money and these things. And it's like putting water in a leaky jar because when we die, we can't take it with us. And instead, we're not focusing on the things which truly adorn us. What adorns us? Virtue. And that, what we've done to our soul, 
And our body is what goes into the next life, not these possessions. For surely it is obvious, I think, even to every child, that none of the things which bring us joy in this life, the things over which most people go crazy, is truly ours and can become ours by nature. Rather, it is clear that they do not belong to anyone at all, neither to those who appear to enjoy them, nor to those who never come near to them. For if someone were to amass gold in boundless measure in this life, not even then does it remain their personal property in possession in possession in perpetuity. Despite all their efforts to secure it, it either deserts them while they are still alive by passing over to those more powerful, somebody takes it from you, or it abandons them on the point of death, okay? Because you can't take it with you. He, I added that part. So either when you when you uh, spend your life accumulating possessions, you're really like a man putting water in a leaking jar. It's, not, it's, it's futile because you can't take it with you. And so we need to have the long view and remember what we can take with us and that is our virtue. So let's take a break at this moment. When we come back, we're going to hear from St. Basil's little little brother, St. Gregory of Nyssa, on this question. And then we're going to continue with Chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel. Join me after the break. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment. But the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Pick up books from Ancient Faith Publishing for your summer reading at store.ancientfaith.com slash summer. That's store.ancientfaith.com slash summer. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church. It's phronima. Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the Orthodox phronema is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox. Now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. So we're going to listen now to St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil the Great's younger brother. And, uh, you know, St. Basil came from a very wealthy Cappadocian family. And uh, had, uh, so many people, of members of his family became saints, were recognized as saints. And he was the older brother, so they had money to send him to uh, Athens, where he studied and he was highly educated along with and there he met Gregory the theologian who became his closest friend. And when the time came to educate uh, the younger brother, they didn't have quite as much money. And so he didn't get that kind of education. But after Basil's death, and Basil died kind of young at the age of 49 and 379 before the Second Ecumenical Council. And it was really left to Gregory the theologian to finish combating the heresies of the fourth century and also Gregory of Nyssa, who had, whom Basil had uh, ordained as a bishop of the city of Nyssa, uh, to really take up the pen and write some beautiful works of theology uh, um, to combat the heresies because Basil died um, too young. And of course, he's known as a very um, a beautiful writer of mystical theology also. So here is St. Gregory of Nyssa speaking about this when we're talking about uh, entering by the narrow gate what is it is that we can take with us and how we can truly benefit ourselves in this life. He who made man in his own image endowed the nature of his handiwork with the principles of all goodness 
Hence, nothing good enters into us from outside. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to say that again. Listen to this. Nothing good enters into us from outside, but it lies within us to have what we will and to bring forth the good from our nature as if from some inner chamber. So think how different this is, how vastly different this is from the Calvinist theology that we are totally depraved and incapable of doing anything good. This is not what the fathers believed. It is within our nature because God made us good. That isn't lost by sin. We still have a good human nature. And we're capable of using that nature because that's what God gave us. It would be ridiculous if God gave us something that we're unable to use. But we have to choose what we're going to follow, whether we're going to use that good or not. So here's again St. Gregory of Nyssa. For from the parts we are taught about the whole, that there is no other way of obtaining one's desire except by procuring the good for oneself. Therefore the Lord said to his hearers, the kingdom of God is within you. And so it depends upon us, and it is in our power, the power of our free will to receive whatever we desire and to find what we seek and to enter where we wish to be. Consequently, the opposite is equally affirmed with us. Namely, that the inclination toward evil also comes into existence uncompelled by any external necessity. Evil subsists as soon as it is chosen. So this, by this he's saying that evil does not actually exist. He's not saying that there is no such thing as evil. He's saying that it doesn't have any real existence until we choose it. And it doesn't have to exist except that we choose to do evil. Do you see the difference? God is good and God truly exists, but evil as, a, as an, an entity, as a nature, it doesn't really exist, but we bring it into existence when we choose to follow it. Evil subsists as soon as it is chosen. It comes into being whenever we elect it. It has no substance of its own. Apart from deliberate choice, evil exists nowhere. Hence, it is evident <clears throat> that the Lord of nature has endowed the nature of man with the power of ruling itself and willingly, willing freely. In other words, we have a free choice. We still have that, even though it's more difficult to choose to do good and we have to fight against the desire to do evil, we don't lose our capacity to free will. For all things, whether good or bad, <clears throat> depend on our choice. But the incorruptible and just sentence of the divine judgment follows the choice we have made according to our purpose and distributes to each what he has happened to prepare for himself. Now, this is a very important point. And perhaps you've had conversations with people about hell. There are people who say hell does not exist. They don't want to believe in hell. And so they, hell, they say hell does not exist because God, who is good and loving, would never send anyone to hell. That's true. God is good and loving, and he doesn't send anyone to hell. But hell does exist because we choose where to go. God does not send us someplace we make those choices that put us on a path. And here, according, this is how St. Gregory of Nyssa phrased it, the just judgment follows the choice we have made according to our purpose and distributes to each what he or she has prepared for himself. So God doesn't interfere with our choice. That's what he's saying. We have chosen in the course of our life to end up in a certain place. It's like saying, I'm going to get on, on freeway five and I'm going to drive north to Canada, but where, where I really want to go, uh, uh, but instead of driving north to Canada, I'm going to turn around and drive south to Mexico. Okay, but I'm on highway five. Well, I want to go to Canada, so I should get there anyhow because I'm on this highway. Does that even make sense? We choose the direction we want to take and then we shouldn't be surprised when we end up in a place that was of our choosing. I want to go to Canada, but I'm going to take five south because that sounds better to me. Okay, so I end up in Mexico. 
oh well that's the choice that i made against everything else that said if you want to go to canada you must go north if you want to go to mexico then you go south but i don't want to accept that and so i'm going to do whatever i want and then expect somehow i'm going to end up in the right place that's folly that's absolute utter foolishness but that's how people think today so no god does not send anyone to hell we choose based on the choices we make we mold ourselves into a holier person or into a sinful person and a sinful person cannot expect to be in union with god in the next life it's just uh, it's, it's not uh, realistic and as he rounds out this discussion saint gregory says mirrors show the faces they reflect precisely as they are cheerful for those who are cheerful gloomy for those who look sad yet no one would hold the nature of the mirror responsible for the gloom of the face reflected if the original itself shows depression so also god's just judgment adapts itself to our disposition according as we do it provides for us from our own okay that's what he says and he is right of course saint gregory of nisa so now the next section here as we round out and finish up the sermon on the mount is about false prophets so this is verse verse 15 beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves you will know them by their fruits are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles of course not. So every sound tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree, evil fruit. A sound tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Now, you know what? There have been many, many pastors uh, of all types and rabbis and imams and all kinds of other so-called religious people who have done evil things and eventually the truth of who they are comes out okay and they by their fruits they came to be known and uh you cannot hide these things forever and it's it's unfortunate we've had some of course in the orthodox church we are not going to deny that but i was thinking about this passage recently because Pat Robertson died a couple of weeks ago, and um, and uh, I was watching on, I think he was the one who had that 700 Club, right? It was a long program about his life, and I started watching it. It was a little bit too much, but they were talking about his, his when he ran for president in the 1980s. Um, I, what I learned was very interesting is that he came out one day from some prayer session that he had and told his inner circle of, of supporters that God told him that he was going to become the president of the United States. So that's why he ran for president, because it was quite unusual for uh, somebody to run for president. And of course, that turned out to be false. So he was a false prophet. And the classic definition of a false prophet is somebody whose prophecies do not come true. Now, when Mitt Romney ran for president, he was also convinced that he was going to uh, become the president of the United States. He's a Mormon because Joseph Smith had made a prophecy that one day a Mormon was going to be elected president. And of course, that did not happen. So uh, there are people who are deluded into thinking that God is speaking to them and that they're truly going to uh, this, this and such thing is going to happen. Now, I think that Pat Robertson never told anybody or that was kept within his inner circle that God said he was going to become the president. Obviously, that's not true, but we've all heard some of these preachers who talk about what's going to happen in the future and then those things don't don't actually take place and of course they reveal themselves as false prophets in this case and not so much because their prophecy didn't come true but the lord here is warning us against false prophets and that we will know them from their fruits so what are their fruits what do we see in so many of these preachers we see an extravagant lifestyle this bears no resemblance 
to the gospel. What is the fruit of that lifestyle? It's a it's a it's a, a life of pride, a life of ma- the acquisition of material possessions. Do they sound anything like Saint Basil or Saint Gregory of Nyssa, who are telling us to pursue virtue? Do they tell us to pursue virtue? Do they embody virtue themselves? Of course not. Okay, so these are the kinds of fruits we should be looking for. Humility, patience, forgiveness, forbearance, modesty, uh, generosity. Th- these kinds of, uh, are the, these are the fruits of the Holy Spirit virtue. And if we don't see that, it doesn't matter how many so-called miracles they're doing or how many ministries they have, how many people they're preaching to Jesus Christ about. Because what matters is whether or not they've produced any fruits and the fruits are not the number of people they rack up that they say they've saved, because very often those are such shallow conversions that they're not really lasting, okay? Uh, The fruits are spiritual, not um, the things that you can measure, how many churches you've opened, how many people came to, to church, because you can have big numbers and it means nothing, okay? So here is Saint Jerome on false prophets in his... Uh, commentary in the Gospel of Matthew. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside they are ravenous wolves. To be sure, this can be understood about all who promise one thing by their dress and speech, but demonstrate something else by their deeds. But it should be understood particularly of the heretics. By their continence, chastity, and fast and fasting, They appear to be wearing, as it were, a kind of garment of piety, but inwardly they have poisonous hearts, and they deceive the hearts of the simpler brothers by the fruits of their soul, then, by which they entice the innocent to destruction. They are conquered. They are compared with ravenous wolves, rather. They are compared to ravenous wolves. So in this case, St. Jerome is talking about heretics because many of the heretics, and we can say this too, about people who are part of um, of certain movements today in society and also of other religions, they have a, a, an appearance of piety. And frankly, I'll tell you, this is true for even some Orthodox, the Orthodox priests. Orthodox priest, one particular that comes to mind, who had an appearance of piety, had a lot of spiritual children, and yet it was discovered that he was doing very immoral things. and yet, But nobody would have ever imagined this. Okay, because he had this uh, p- appearance of severity and extremeness and this kind of a thing. You, this is what I meant when I said eventually these things come to light. Okay, and people are revealed for what they truly are. Um, so we have to be very careful when and discerning about who we choose to follow, especially in the terms of a spiritual father. Now, most parish priests are perfectly fine. There's no problem with them. But sometimes if a parish priest asks us for something that's inappropriate, and you know what I'm talking about, you who are adults, or if they ask you for money for themselves, not for the church, or if they're misusing church funds or something like this, doing something kind of fishy, this is a a sign that this person is corrupt. I did a whole series of of lessons on, on corrupt priests, I'm sorry to say, but it was called for. Um, But we do have this because Satan wants to uh, destroy the priests um, above all else, because when he brings down a priest, he also succeeds in in, uh, corrupting others and also uh, leading others to despair in the church. So another, let's take a look at St. Jerome on the fruit. And this is uh, St. Jerome, again, from his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. So he says, by your fruits, you will know them. Now, um, I can't remember which father, I think it was Chrysostom who said, um, when he says, by, by your fruits you will know them, that, um, that very often they think of these, the, the people who are the false prophets and the people who don't bear fruits, very often they are uh, usually associated with heretics. But how is it possible that someone can bear fruit at all? Because we haven't come to this part yet where the Lord says, You, Lord, when he's denouncing these people, we cast out demons in your name and we did miracles in your name. And I was, I always found that very, um, difficult to understand. Oh, we're going to get to that passage in a minute. But the fact is people can change. 
So you can have a person who's a wonderful priest and he becomes corrupt. I mean, people don't usually come to the priesthood with the intention of becoming corrupt, but the devil finds a way to lead them astray and they become corrupt. That's not how they intend it usually in the beginning. I think there are people who know that there's money to be made in religion and they do create a church so that they can simply become wealthy and manipulate people. I think that does exist. That doesn't happen in the Orthodox Church. I haven't known that to happen. People usually have good intentions, but they're weak, and they uh, end up becoming corrupted by the evil one. So here is St. Jerome. Judas, who at one time was a good tree, produced evil fruit when he betrayed the Savior. So he turned out to be not a good tree, right? They saw his fruit. And Paul, who was an evil tree at one time when he was persecuting Christ's church, produced good fruit, good fruit later on when he was transformed from a persecutor into a vessel of election. Therefore, a good tree does not produce evil fruit as long as it continues in the pursuit of goodness. And an evil tree abides in the fruit of sins as long as it is not converted to repentance. So that's the difference between us and trees. So a tree really can't change. The tree is not going to change a kind of fruit. But we as human beings can change. If we are producing evil fruit, we can change. We can repent and start producing good fruit. And we have lots of examples of that in the Orthodox Church in the lives of the saints. And conversely, we can have a good fruit, a good tree that produces good fruit, slowly become corrupt and end up evil. So we have people who lose their salvation or they corrupt others. And then they lead to such a heartache and despair among the faithful when they find out that, in fact, this person was actually quite corrupt. Here is St. Jerome. So here is the next verse. And this is the part that always, you know, fascinated me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers. That's pretty scary. People who were casting out demons and committing miracles end up in hell. Yes, depart from you, evil doers. You're going to go to that other place. I, I never knew you. How is that even possible? So first, let's listen to St. Jerome, what he says about this. Those who were not wearing the garment of a good life must not be received on account of the wickedness of their dogmas. Now here he's talking about heretics. Those who were not, um, sorry, and now he asserts the converse. So in other words, there are people who present themselves very well. Okay, a very good example are the Mormons. The Mormons have these wonderful programs or families and they're very, they live very clean and squeaky lives, no drinking, or many of the Baptists, no drinking and no dancing. And there's a lot of people who have a real piety, but that doesn't mean that their doctrines are correct. So there's a big difference between Mormons and Baptists. Sorry to any of you Baptists. Baptists are Christians. Mormons are not. Mormons are heretics of the worst kind because they teach that a human being can actually become God, equal to, the God, to God the Father the God of this planet. They are, they believe in many gods. That's the truth. Okay. They don't tell you that when they first meet you and they try to convert you. So they have an appearance of piety. These young men in black ties and white shirt come knocking on your door. We want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. They seem like Christians, but see here he's saying we must not be, uh, we, we must not receive them an account of their, their, uh, they, they apparently have a good life. They live a, a life of some piety. They live a clean life. They seem to be doing good works. That's not a reason to accept their dogmas. This is what St. Jerome says. Of course not. And now the Lord asserts the, uh, the converse, the opposite. In order to prevent the faith from being uh, accommodated to those 
who, though they may be strong with the soundness of faith, live basely by their evil works and destroy the soundness of doctrine. So in other words, conversely, you can't say that somebody is okay who's living an evil life, living a sinful life, just because their doctrines are okay. So both are necessary. We must have correct doctrine and a correct way of life. So he says, um, they are refuted who claim the knowledge of the Lord without works. So people who say that they know the Lord, and yet they, they don't show that by their way of life, in fact, do not know the Lord, because he says here, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And the apostle says in the same sense, the Harry means Paul, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. That's the truth. So um, let's take a look at St. John Chrysostom and what he says about this particular passage. There are some who say they made this assertion falsely. In other words, when they when the Lord says that on that day, he's talking about the day of judgment, people will say, Lord, Lord, um, uh, didn't we cast out demons in your name? We worked miracles in your name. And then um, he's going to say, some people say, well, how is that? Because the question is, how is that possible that people who did these things did not end up in the kingdom of heaven, but were condemned by the Lord? So Chrysostom says that some people are saying that they never actually knew the Lord. They weren't, they never did these things, that this is a lie. And he says, no, it's not a lie. Okay. Because it follows from his conclusion that, that his intention is to make out that the faith is of no avail without works. So he added the miracles also. So it's not enough to say, Lord, Lord. Now let's start with that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Well, where are the Protestants who say that all you have to do is say that you believe in the Lord? If that's not enough, according to Jesus, it, you have to do certain things. You have to do the will of God. So people try to get around this and they say, well, no, if you really are a Christian, you will do that. No, that's not what he's saying. It's not enough to say you believe to have faith. You have to do the will of God. So this is something which we will see repeatedly throughout the gospel of Matthew, an emphasis on both hearing and then doing. It's not enough simply to accept or to believe that we must be active. We must do certain things. So Chrysostom says, if they had not done the miracles, how could this point have been made out here? And besides, would they have dared when the judgment had come to say these things to his face? And even in his reply, they're speaking in this way of question, implies that they did, rot, uh, they had wrought them. In other words, they did do these miracles. Okay. They, having seen the end Contrary to their expectation, in other words, the people who are about to go to that other place, H-E double sticks, <laughs> we have this wonderful priest who used to call it H-E double sticks, the people who are destined for that other place, and again, God isn't sending them there, they've chosen to go there by their evil deeds, when they see that they're destined to go there, and they're objecting, but Lord, we did this and this and this, Chrysostom is saying, that when they see that they're going to that place, contrary to their expectation, after they had been seen here on earth, admired by all for their miracles, beholding themselves there with nothing but punishment awaiting them, they are amazed and marveling. They say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? How, are you, where, how then do you turn away from us now? But though they marveled because they are punished after working such miracles, yet do not marvel. For all the grace was a free, of, of the free gift was him that gave it. But they contributed nothing by their part. In other words, God offered them grace, but they didn't use that, okay? Wherefore, they are justly punished as having been ungrateful and without feeling toward him, whom they, although they had honored him with their words, as to bestow his grace upon them as though unworthy. 
How did they perform such things while working iniquity? Some say that it was not at the time when they did these miracles, but that they changed afterwards to do this iniquity. But if this was the case, a second time, the point at which he is laboring fails to be established. For what he took pains to point out is this. He's talking about the Lord. That neither faith nor miracles avail where practice is not. Okay, in other words, it's not enough to do miracles if you aren't living a life of virtue. Okay, that's not enough. Even to have enough, you can have not only faith and not only the ability to work miracles or actual miracles, you have to live the life. You have to do the will of God the Father. This is what he's saying here. Quite remarkable. So who are these people that he's saying, go to this other place? Um, who are these people, you ask? Many of them that believed received gifts, such as he that was casting out demons and was not with him, such as Judas, for even two, as wicked as he was, had a gift. Okay? Since all men are not meet for all things, some were of a pure life, not having so great faith, and others on the contrary. So his point here is that it is possible to even to do miracles and still not be saved. So we're at the top of the hour. Let's take a little break and we'll come back to the dis dis discussion after the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. This is Elisa Bielitich Davis. Join me, Mother Catherine Weston, and Dr. Edith Humphrey, guest speakers at this year's Ancient Faith Women's Retreat. Visit store.ancientfaith.com slash events for details and to register. The crucifixion and resurrection of Christ are central events in our salvation. Yet few Christians have a good grasp of the first century historical and religious context in which the crucifixion took place nor of its true significance for the people of that time, and hence for our time as well. In her book, The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, biblical scholar Dr. Jeannie Constantinou puts modern readers in the center of the events of Christ's Passion, bringing the best of modern scholarship to bear while keeping her interpretation faithful in every particular to the early church tradition. If you love Search the Scriptures live on Ancient Faith Radio, you'll also love The Crucifixion of the King of Glory, available now at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. So we are discussing the statement, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, he means judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers. So right now we're going to turn to St. Ignatius Brinchaninov. I hope I said that right. And this is from his book, The Refuge. And here he's talking about salvation and Christian perfection. So every Orthodox Christian, if he wishes to pass from a slothful life to an attentive life, if he wishes to labor at his salvation, he must first pay attention to his relations with fellow men. In these interactions, he must correct everything that needs correction, and he must offer God sincere repentance for everything that is already beyond correction, and he must predetermine how he will begin to act in all things in a way that pleases God. So why is he talking about this? Because it's not enough to simply say, Lord, Lord, uh, and I want to be with you in the kingdom of heaven. We have to do the will of God the Father. This is what, and what is the will of God the Father? That we live an upright and holy life, a blameless life. But we have to work at that. It doesn't just happen by itself. It's, it's a very arduous. That's why he says, that's why this instruction follows that statement, enter by the narrow gate. 
because the road to perdition is wide and many people find it. So we have to really work at this. And it's, uh, it's not uh, reasonable. It's certainly not part of the gospel to expect that we can enter the kingdom of heaven without tremendous effort on our part. So uh, St. Ignatius Brinchaninov continues and he says, um, speaking about, um, uh, speaks about, he talks about Zacchaeus, who after, is, is only after he says to the Lord that he's going to pay back, restore the fourfold, those whose money he's stolen, and he's given half of his money to the poor. It's only after that that the Lord says, today salvation has come to this house. In the same way, as long as a Christian continues to live a sinful life, contrary to the commandments of the gospel, he is not a Christian at all, even though he has the right to be called so, for he has joined the Christian race by holy baptism. But what is the use of a confession in words when you, what you reject indeed? And then I will declare to them, away from you, away from you evildoers, I never knew you, that is, those who disdain to fulfill the commandments of the gospel, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. To be saved, it is necessary to fulfill all the commandments of the gospel, which are only preserved in their necessary fullness in the one holy Orthodox Church. So going back to our original <laughs> beginning in this uh, particular lesson, what does the Orthodox Church have? It has the fullness of what is useful and necessary for salvation. So um, it, what's kind of interesting here is when he says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, well, Lord, Lord, um, you know, that's what we say a lot. We talk about, we say the Lord's ha Lord have mercy. We say that again and again and again. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. We say this many, many times. And yet, uh, do we really mean that? So we have a caller, and who is our caller today? Someone from Tucson, Arizona. Brian, is it Brian from Tucson, Arizona? Uh, not Tucson, but Bullhead. Okay, Bullhead, Arizona. Welcome, yeah. Brian. Welcome to Search the Scriptures. Do you have a comment or a question? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, you know, about what you're talking about, I'd just like to know who, in your opinion, you think, that Messiah is talking about on Judgment Day when that happens. It's taken me years and years, and I can tell you my opinion, but I'd love to know what you think. Who's not going to be accepted? Who's the people that he says, Lord, Lord? Mm-hmm, exactly. But, well, he's the, we're, we're talking about the fathers. It has nothing to do with my opinion. The fathers of the church say those because he says, it's not those who say Lord, to me, Lord, Lord, but those who do, do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the ones who do not do the will of God, we've so, so far read from several fathers, those who do not do the will of God and simply give mouth service, lip service to Christ, who say they recognize Christ as Lord, but they really don't live according to his commandments. Do you have a different idea about this? That's what the no, fathers no, of my, the church my, say. Mine's the, no, my, mine's the same, but let's say, you know, for one example, mm -hmm. let's take the Sabbath. Now, how many people observe the Sabbath? Are you, well, talking about me, mm -hmm. huh? are you talking about Sunday to keep Sunday holy, or are you talking about Saturday? Saturday, Saturday. Well, well, that's 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 not the Christian Sabbath. The Christian Sabbath is Sunday. I know, but but okay. If we take the commandments, you can't take that commandment uh, out. Uh, course, okay, right? okay. I see what you're talking about. Well, we discussed that a little bit earlier in this in this um, Sermon on the Mount. The Lord said, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So the Christian understanding is that Christ has fulfilled the law and the prophets. So we don't observe those laws in the same way that the Jews observed them. But we're still following them. But they're fo they are followed in the Christian manner because Christ fulfilled them. Christ elevated the teachings of the church from what Judaism had, which was a very legalistic notion, um, something that focused on external acts of piety, external ideas of, of ritual cleanliness and holiness versus inner virtue. So is that what you're talking about? You think that we're, we maybe we need to be observing some of these Jewish rules? 
<clears throat> okay, I, I agree with you with the Jewish Jewish and Judaism mm-hmm. to me. I've I've researched it and I was actually raised that, but um okay. <clears throat> that's Pharisee. That's like modern Pharisee. You yes. know, from what I you know, from what I found out, let me ask you this. The whole Bible is about one thing, a relationship. Mm-hmm. It's about relationship. <clears throat> okay? And it's not about a religion. I'm on this religion. I'm on that religion. It's about a relationship, you know. <clears throat> and as long as you have that, and then you do the will of the Father, which the will of the Father and the Son are the same thing. The Son That's and the right. Father are the same thing. That's same right. Thing. You know, <clears throat> there's he's not going to do something that the Father doesn't want. The Father's not going to do nothing that the Son doesn't want. It's all he's been given authority over everything. He's coming yes. back and he's going to set everything right. And <clears throat> wow, I can't wait for that day. You know, you know what gives me hope is just every day that goes by is one more day we're closer to the kingdom. And I'm like, hallelujah. Well, hopefully, <clears throat> if but for Christ, it, what Christ is telling us here is we're closer to the kingdom if we're doing the will of God. His point here is that it's not enough just to say we believe, to call Jesus the Lord. We have to actually live according to that. That's what his point is here. You would agree with that. You know what I feel like? Um, Just for my little thing, uh, I got converted, and I started getting my conversion in 2016, and then I got Mm -hmm. baptized in 2019. Mm -hmm. And... Just with with everything that's happened to me on my walk and how much I've learned and grown, to me, I feel like I'm under the Father's wing, and like I'm I'm protected. I don't gotta worry. Like a lot of people are afraid of, you know, new AI coming and how the world's changing and blah blah blah. I'm just like, you know what? He's gonna take care of me. I'm not worried about that's, it. That's that's faith, and that that's good. That's a good thing to have. That we don't, we shouldn't have anxiety over these things. We simply continue on our path, doing, trying to do the will of God every day, and that's really what the Lord is talking about here. And you're absolutely right not to have anxiety because there's nothing we can do about that. And we, if we have faith, we believe that God will see us through any of those things. So uh, thanks yes. so much for your your input and for calling in today, Brian. And God bless. Well, thank you. Have thank a, you. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Okay, so let's turn to St. Ignatius Brinchaninov. I was starting to say that the the Lord says here, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And we say repeatedly, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Are we really living a life which is in conformity with the will of God? Are we pursuing virtue? Are we trying to make ourselves into better people? And not only do we, can we think about the terms or, or the word, the prayer, Lord have mercy, but also the Jesus prayer. And I wanted to read to you this very striking um, statement by St. Ignatius Brinchaninov because he related this statement of the Lord, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He related it to the Jesus prayer. And I thought it was so useful um, because he's also giving some very good advice to us about how we need to go about the prayer and not to focus so much on mechanics. I thought it might be something useful for you to uh, to listen to. And it fits in with our discussion today because this is what he was thinking of. So here is uh, St. Um, Ignatius Brinchaninov um, on the Jesus prayer. <clears throat> because of our spiritual infancy, the Holy Fathers offer us certain techniques, as we have already said, to better train ourselves in the Jesus prayer. Now, in case you don't know, this has to do with usually tying the prayer to your breathing and also uh, sort of assuming a sitting posture, this kind of a thing. Now, these techniques are nothing other than techniques, and they are not anything special. We must not pay too much attention to them, nor should we ascribe too much importance to them. All the power and action of the Jesus prayer flows from the worshipped and almighty name of Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In order to acquire this ability in ourselves, we must be remade according to the commandment of the gospel. 
the Lord himself said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Both the one that awaits us after our blessed repose and the one who is revealed to us in our earthly life, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. For the advanced, such external methods are not necessary. He's talking about methods of prayer. And this is really good for those of you who are kind of into this sort of thing. Even in the midst of crowds, they remain in stillness. This is, he's talking about people who have an advanced spirituality can be very still. They can keep that inner quiet, even in a crowd. All obstacles to spiritual advancement are within us, only within us. If something acts on us from without as a hindrance, and then this only serves as a rebuke to our infirm will, our double-mindedness, our sin-damaged nature, we would need no external methods if we lived as we should live. Our life is lax. Our will is precarious, worthless, and so we need external techniques, just as those with pained legs need crutches and a staff. The merciful fathers, seeing that I desire to practice the Jesus prayer, and also seeing that I am completely alive to the world, so that it acts powerfully on me through my senses, advise me to pray in a solitary dark cell, so that my senses will not uh, come will come into inactivity, so that my conversation with the world will cease, so that I will descend into myself. They advise me to sit in my prayer on a low stool so that my body will have the placement of a pauper who asks for alms. When I am present at a service in church and pray the Jesus prayer during the service, the fathers advise me to close my eyes to better protect myself against distraction. There are many other external methods followed by practitioners of prayer. These methods can be used beneficially but their use must differ according to the spiritual and physical qualities of each person. Some mechanisms that are very beneficial for um, a certain ascetic can be useless or even harmful for another. The advanced reject all external techniques. So I'm, I'm trying to call that to your attention because of how he says that some things that are good for one person are are not useful or even harmful to someone else. That's why you are not supposed to read these spiritual works and say, oh, Saint so-and-so did this, so I'm going to do that, as if it's some kind of a formula by which you can acquire a certain grace. You may very well be opening yourself up to spiritual harm. That's why we follow the advice of a spiritual father. That's why we place ourselves under obedience to a spiritual father for such matters. As he continues, he says, Let us practice the Jesus prayer without expectation of gain, with simplicity and firmness of intention, our only purpose being repentance, with faith in God, with complete fidelity to the will of God, with trust in the wisdom, goodness, and in omnipotence of his holy will. So he, he's talking about the fact that it is not enough simply to say the words of the prayer. We have to live the prayer. We have to follow the advice of the Holy Fathers. Now, what about the fact that the Lord says, it doesn't matter that you cast out demons or you did miracles in my name. I never knew you. That's a pretty scary thought if you ask me. What does St. Gregory Palamas say about the fact about that fact. How is it possible to work miracles in the name of God? And what about people who do work miracles? Should we look upon them as somehow special as people who somehow are already saints? We have to be very, very careful about this because people are capable of doing miracles and it may not have anything to do with their particular spiritual disposition. Do you remember that there's a story in the gospels in which somebody who was not among the 12 was casting out, uh, out demons in, in the name of, of Jesus. And the disciples said, Hey Jesus, this guy who's not with us, he's casting out demons in your name. So it's possible. All right. 
So here's St. Gregory Palamas on the fact that some people are capable of doing miracles, and yet they might not be saved. This is St. Gregory Palamas on his homily on the healing of the boy with a demon. Driving away demons, however, is not required of us, and even if we were able to drive them away, it will be of no advantage to us if we live carelessly. I love that. What does he say? We don't have to drive out demons. Nobody, nowhere in the scriptures does the Lord say, you have to work miracles. You have to be able to drive out demons. Some people may do that, but others may never and still acquire the kingdom of heaven. He says that does us no good if we live carelessly, according to the, the way it's worded by St. Gregory Palamas. So we don't, it doesn't prove anything about our salvation if we're able to do those things. As a matter of fact, the devil could use this to work against us and to make us proud. So that's nothing. So many, he, it says, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name we have cast out devils. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It is much more profitable for us to strive to banish the passions of fornication, anger, hatred, and pride, rather than to cast out demons. Being delivered from bodily sins is not enough. We must cleanse the inner energy which dwells within our soul. For out of our hearts proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts and covetousness and so on these are what motivate people so his point is that even if even when he says your body does nothing sin can be active in your mind so it's not enough that we do all these miracles and that alone proves nothing so instead what we should be striving for is to do the will of god and striving to eradicate the passions which afflict our soul now before we stop, I also wanted to read for you. We don't normally hear about uh, from uh, St. Athanasius, but in his uh, very famous work, The Life of Anthony, St. Anthony talks about this, about the fact that, of course, uh, the crafty one, the evil one, does many things um, to us. He's very, very um, sneaky. And so in The Life of Anthony, which is a classic, of the spirituality of the early church, something that you should read if you've never read it. Uh, here is um, here is uh, Saint Anthony, according to uh, as as recorded by Saint Athanasius of Alexandria. So he's talking about how uh, the demons can deceive people by having apparitions. Something that we've also spoken about before. We have to be very careful not to believe the images that we see, the dreams that we have, people who have visions sh should not simply accept them as actually coming from God because the evil one uses them too to deceive us and to cause us to do uh, the wrong thing. Um, so when the demons see that people are fearful, they multiply the apparitions so as to terrify them all the more and descend in order to malign them, saying, fall down and worship me. In this way, they deceived the Greeks, they mean, he means the pagans, who considered them to be gods and are fal falsely named. But the Lord did not allow us to be beguiled by the devil and censuring him whenever he made appearances. He said, be gone, Satan. So when the Lord was tempted, he recognized that this was from the evil one and he sent him away. Therefore, let the crafty one be despised by us more and more. For what the Lord has said, this he has done for our sakes, so that when the demons hear sayings of this source, sort from us, they may be chased away through the Lord, who in these words censured them. So we don't accept anything that comes from the evil one, even if it doesn't seem to be bad at the moment. This is why we are not to trust in ourselves. And instead, we have to listen to uh, follow the advice of a spiritual father, somebody who is experienced in these matters. There's a, um, I'll tell you, I was going to tell you kind of a funny story about St. Paisios, but I will finish with what St. Anthony, Anthony says here. We ought not boast 
about expelling demons, nor become proud on account of healings performed. We are not to marvel only at him who casts out a demon and treat with disdain one who does not. Let one learn well the discipline of each and let him either copy and emulate it or correct it. For the performance of signs does not belong to us. This is the Savior's work. So he said to the disciples, Do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So again, the casting out of demons or the working of miracles is not from us. Even if we pray very hard that the Lord have mercy upon someone and heal them, that doesn't happen because of us. If they, if they are healed, that's the work of the Lord, right? So we're not supposed to take pride in this because this could actually lead us astray. So we're not supposed to be, be also be impressed by others who do these things. The fact that the names are written in heaven is a witness to our virtue and manner of life, but the ability to expel demons is itself a gift from the Savior who bestowed it. So to those boasting, not in virtue, but in signs, saying, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in the, your name? Um, the Lord does not know the ways of the ungodly. Certainly one must pray, as I said earlier, to receive the gift of discernment of spirits so that one might not, as the scripture says, believe every spirit. Okay. It was my wish to remain silent and say nothing of my own contest. This is St. Anthony, of course, but be satisfied with these remarks alone. However, lest you think that I am talking about these things in general terms, in order that you might be sure that I describe these matters from experience and fact, for this reason, if, if I become like a fool, the Lord who hears me knows that my conscience is pure. I'm telling you what cunning pursuits of the demons I myself have seen. How many times they called me blessed, and I cursed them in the Lord's name. How often... They have prophesied about the water of the river. And I said to them, what concern is that of yours? Once they came in with their threats and they encircled me like warriors in battle array. Another occasion, they fulfilled, they filled my dwelling with horses and beasts and serpents. <laughs> and I sang some glory in chariots and some in horses, but I will glory in the name of the Lord. And in these prayers, they were repelled by the Lord. Once they came in darkness, having the experience, the appearance of light and saying, we have come to bring light to you, Anthony, but shutting my eyes, I prayed. And immediately the light of the impious ones was extinguished. And a few months later, they came in as ones chanting and quoting from the scriptures. And once they shook the cell, but I prayed and remained unshaken in my purpose. So I'm going to stop there. But you can see how many ways they try to fool us. And it is the the saints of the desert, the monastics, uh, who have struggled with um, the demons who know their tricks, that this is why we have to be very careful not to trust every vision. So the thing that I was reading about from the life of St. Paisios, it was his uh, feast day this past week, by the way, the life of St. Paisios, that he said that he... Um, Something happened and he was being very severely tormented by demons in the desert of Mount Sinai for a while when he lived there. And he had an alarm clock. He used to always have, I imagine it was like a wind-up clock that he kept and he must have used it to sort of keep his rule of prayer. Uh, he had an alarm clock and at one point uh, he threw it on the rocks, you know, out of frustration with what the demons were doing. And he, he said it bounced and then he watched it stop in midair and it slowly descended onto a rock and it stayed there perfect in other words it was not harmed and this of course was done by the demons and he realized that and he went down there and here it was perfectly good. now he was out in the middle of the sinai desert it's not like he could easily get another alarm clock 
But he realized that this was a trick of the devil for him to take it back to his cell and continue to use that clock. But he realized it. So he took it and he smashed it on the rock. He says, I'm not going to let you do me any favors. So even when the devil or any of the evil ones are trying to do something good for us, we never accept that. So just as the Lord uh, was tempted in his first temptation to eat, to change the stones into bread, even though he was hungry, and there's no sin in eating after you have been fasting for 40 days. He did not accept that temptation because it came from the evil one. So we have to look behind the obvious things sometimes and look at what might really be behind this uh, suggestion that is coming to us. Well, we didn't quite finish the um, Sermon on the Mount, but we're very, very close. And uh, next week, we're going to talk about the last section, which is about building your house on the rock or building your house on the sand. And as we conclude the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to take a look back at it. And I'm going to remind you how to remember the content and the structure of St. Matthew's Gospel in a way that I hope will be useful to you. And then we will continue it with chapter 8. And I hope you will join us at that time. Now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Good night. Mm -hmm.